let's pick up. So hello everyone. I'm Jesse Hoogland, and today I'm going to tell you a little something about why learning theory is quite literally the physics of intelligence. Uh, maybe a little bit, more, little bit more about me. I'm a research assistant at the University of Cambridge under David Kruger's group. And I'm studying mostly science of deep learning uh, with a focus on AI safety and alignment. Hopefully we can talk a little bit about, about that as well. But without further ado, we've got to get the show off the road, on the road. So <laughs> let's, let's get going. All right, the main takeaway I want to leave with you with today is that there's an awful lot of information in the structure of the lost landscape. All right, so this is a, an insight we've had in physics for decades. In physics, it's the, the geometry of the energy landscape that decides many of the relevant physical properties of the systems we're interested in. In machine learning, it's going to be the geometry of the lost landscape that we're interested in. So lost landscape contains more information than you might naively expect. Boom, that's it. End of talk. Let's, you guys are free to go home. Now, I'm going to give this talk. I'm going to start with a little bit about learning theory, why we might do it, you know, what our aims are in doing learning theory. Talk about classical learning theory, the results we get out of it, get out of it, the limitations of classical learning theory. We'll talk about singular learning theory and why it's necessary to make sense of any sufficiently complicated model class like neural networks. And I'll talk a little bit about what's next, next for applying singular learning theory to AI safety and beyond. Now, this isn't the normal talk I give, so I'm going to start with a few words on AI safety, alignment, you know, what our concern is here. Um, you know, this is a huge topic, so I don't have time to go into everything. But we'll start with a very simple observation, and that's the scaling laws. Right, Kaplan et al., already before then, it was observed that if you make models bigger, you train them for longer, you train them on more data, they just keep getting better. So there are two salient features here. Performance scales reliably with these quantities. And at the same time, specific capabilities emerge suddenly, unpredictably. Now this is somewhat contested. So there's a recent paper about the mirage of metrics, and it turns out that some of these emergent abilities we see you know, are an artifact of the specific metrics we're plotting, but still, you know, GPT-3 does things that GPT-2 couldn't, GPT-4 does things that GPT-3 couldn't, and so on. Things that they were not explicitly trained for, things that they just happened to learn. How to play chess, how to, you know, model humans uh, and human personality flaws, and maybe eventually take advantage of those. So the concern here is that we keep doing this. At some point, we reach human level-ish, and it doesn't stop at that point. Right? The, the level we could attain here could be quite a lot higher than the, the human baseline, the human level we're familiar with. And pretty much by default, when you have a very capable system, well, every time we've had this in history, the less intelligent species, the less technologically advanced species, uh, doesn't have a great time. And we're afraid that that's going to happen to us if we're not careful. We don't know how to reliably encode our, our values. We don't, you know, know exactly what's going to happen when we reach those thresholds. And so a concern with safety is you know, how do we make sure that this transition goes, goes well? How do we make sure that we end up in a world where we're no longer the dominant species, but we're also still in existence? And that's what my aim is going to be with this, um, mostly within the framework of interpretability. How can we understand what's going on inside of these systems? Can we predict certain of these emergent capabilities? So we get warning, warning signs. So we know, oh, this model has suddenly learned how to be deceptive in very dangerous ways, in ways that are you know, far beyond human level. Can we, can we set limits? Can we constrain them? Can people and teams hear me again? Yeah, I think they can see that. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to have you guys back. <laughs> Shall we continue? Oh, we have so many slides to get through. Oh, my god. <laughs> Okay, learning theory. We're moving, getting, getting through it. Why theory? Let's start there, right? What is the thing that we are trying to do? Well, I come at this from a background in physics and theoretical physics. So I think of the role of theory as having three main, 
functions. First, theory helps us develop measuring devices, what we would in AI call interpretability tools. Right? We want to understand what's going on inside these systems. Next, theory helps us because it tells us where to look, where to direct our experimental apparatus. And third, uh, maybe the most important one, is it helps us establish a common language between theorists and experimentalists so we can go ahead and do good work. Now, none of this is without risk, right? So physics gave us, quantum physics gave us electron microscopes, but it also gave us the atomic bomb. Um, we could get very dangerous new abilities if we're not careful. Now, just as theory tells you where to look, it also tells you where not to look. And so it can mislead you and lead you to neglect important parts of the problem. You have to be careful with that. And finally, you might get a crisp formalism but in the end, it's nothing but you know, highfalutin, abstracts, beautiful math. Just think about, when, when's the last time string theorists did something tangibly for the world, right? So theory isn't without, without its risks. But I think, for the moment, we know rather little about neural networks. And I think it would be a good thing to know a little bit more about them before we get to very capable AI. So. Let's start getting to the actual talk. What is learning? Throughout this talk, I'm going to give you a few different definitions, starting with learning is Bayesian inference. Right? Now, this is not the final definition I want to leave you with. We're going to iterate on this and make it better and better over time. But when I say that learning is Bayesian inference, what I mean is that you have some hypothesis class. And you have some prior over this hypothesis class, some called uncertainty, a belief over these different hypotheses ahead of time. And then you get some data sampled from some true distribution, unknown true, dis true distribution. And you obtain a posterior, a new you know, evaluation of, of belief over these hypotheses. So you know, in particular, when I say learning is Bayesian inference, it's about updating your belief in hypotheses in response to data. Now, all these quantities have a name. You know, there's a likelihood, the prior, the model evidence, posterior. Great. This is where we're starting. Now, in practice, to actually make this implementable, we make a change. Right? Instead of thinking about abstract hypotheses, we think about parameterized models. So now we're learning something that you can differentiate. You can move through the space and change the, the weights a little bit and find a new model. So learning is updating your belief in weights of some parameterized model class in response to data. And in general, we're going to do this with more than one sample. We're going to do it in response to a data set. And so your likelihood on the top becomes some product over uh, individual samples likelihoods. So we're assuming they're independent and identically sam uh, sampled. And your model evidence, this denominator, is just going to be a new, a, an integral over the, over the top. A normalizing factor, if you like. All right, so there's, there's a problem with this definition. And that problem is that this integral here is just completely obscene and totally impossible and intractable, and it explodes exponentially, and we can't do it. So unfortunately, we cannot be perfect Bayesian reasoners. Instead, let's propose the first change, learning as approximately Bayesian reasoning. All right. So one, one example of what you can do is, now assume you have lots and lots of data. Now as you take more and more data, the posterior is going to clump closer and closer around the optimal parameter values. It's what's, what's called asymptotically normal, because it becomes more and more normal and peaked around these values. And so what you can do is, instead of thinking about learning um, a density, estimating densities, you estimate points. Right. We only want to learn the maximum, um, the, the best parameter value in this, in this space. Simplifies the problem quite a lot. But we can do more things. So for example, suppose your data comes from something that's mostly deterministic. Right? It's generated by some function and then isotropic noise. <coughs> something like this. If this is the case, then you can make additional simplifications. And you can think about learning some parameter value that minimizes the risk, where the risk evaluates how close your model function is to some, some ideal function. 
and this is the population risk. It evaluates the difference between your model function and the target function over each individual point. Now, the next amendment to our definition is going to be to take this final definition of, of empirical risk minimization as a, as a new starting point. And instead of treating it as a, some limiting case of Bayesian inference, we can treat it as some new learning problem on its own right. So that's what I propose next, right? Learning is empirical risk minimization. So two important problem, uh, changes. First, instead of uh, density estimation, we're doing point estimation. And second, we're estimating functions instead of probability distributions. Now, what we'll see later is that when the parameter function map is not one-to-one, -one, when different choices of the weights implement the same function, things get weird. Right? And this is the basis for singular learning theory. This is true for pretty much every model class we care about, whether it's neural networks or hidden Markov models or Gaussian mixtures, you name it. Like, this is usually the case. And it breaks a lot of the existing theory. Okay. For now, this definition is good enough. It's not the last definition, but we can move on now and talk about what learning theory is. Right? If learning is about minimizing the risk, well, then learning theory is about managing the risk. We care about minimizing this empirical risk only insofar as it minimizes the population risk. Right? The, the difference between our, our true function, our model function, and the true function evaluated over all possible samples. And so what learning theorists do is, you know, we want to minimize the population risk, but we don't have access to it directly, so we break it apart into a bunch of different terms we can look at. There's the generalization error, there's the approximation error at the bottom, which tells us, you know, how good is the, the best possible function in our model class. Uh, optimization, which is about how, how close does our optimizer get to the best function. You know, do we find local minima or global minima? And then generalization. How well does our model train on this set of data transfer to new data? And typically, the way these we try to obtain expressions for these bounds is as follows. We try to get a bound that looks like this. So we want the probability to be at least this high, that the error is no greater than this. That's most of classical learning theory. That's the classical statistical learning theory. Right, so we don't have time to go into all of this in all of these three categories, but we will take a look at generalization. This question of how well does your model transfer to new data from the data set to the true distribution. Now, in particular, there are two ways to go about this, two main approaches to obtaining these generalization bounds. So first looks at the complexity of the entire model class, and the second looks at how sensitive individual models are in this model class. The idea behind the first is, if you have two model classes, and one of them is simpler than the other, it achieves similar performance, you should go with the simpler one, out of a kind of Occam's razor intuition. You can formalize. And you can you know, formalize this notion of simplicity in a bunch of different ways. There are VC dimensions, and Rademacher complexities, covering numbers, fat shattering dimensions, you name it, the whole zoo. In every case, the, the intuition is similar. Now, the problem with this approach is that it, it coarse grains at too high a level. It tries to come up with universal statements that apply to the entire model class. As soon as you're dealing with any sufficiently expressive model classes, model classes that are very large, as is the case for neural networks, you can't come up with very strong bounds this way. Coming up with, trying to come up with universal statements runs into no free lunchy effects, and so the bounds just end up being weak. So instead, what we should do, I propose, is try to break it down. Right? We want to measure things, partition this into smaller model subclasses, and then we can make stronger statements if we know which of those subclasses our model happens to be in. And this is, I mean, this is thermodynamics, what I'm proposing here. In thermodynamics, you have some phase space, where each point in this phase space corresponds to one way of configuring your system one way of assigning velocities and positions to all the particles in some gas. And you measure things like the temperature, or the volume, or the chemical potential. And each of these things partitions the phase space into macrostates. Those are the sets of microstates 
individual points, which are compatible with this large-scale observation. So we need to do something similar for the case of uh, neural networks in order to obtain stronger bounds. Yeah, and what that might look like in the case of neural networks is you measure something like the weight norm. Measuring the weight norm partitions this into a bunch of shells. And we know that increasing weight norm correlates with more complex models. So in this way, you can obtain stronger bounds. Now, the second approach to obtaining generalization bounds looks at the sensitivity of individual models. So what you do is you train some model, you obtain F, and then you apply a little bit of noise. And you look at how much does the training error or the training, you know, the, the risk, the empirical risk, change in response to this noise. If it changes only a little bit, then you expect the test error to also be close. That can be very far away. And you can apply this noise to a bunch of different, different places. You can apply it to the inputs. If you have a classifier and you have a large margin, if the decision boundary is very far from all of the points, then applying a little bit of noise to the inputs, it's probably not going to cross that decision boundary. And so you can generalize, you expect better generalization. Similarly, you have this, this margin, uh, this minimum flatness, minimum sharpness stuff. So if you have a very flat loss basin, then adding a little bit of noise to the, to the weights isn't going to change the, the weights a lot. And finally, you have things like um, apply the noise to the training samples, maybe an individual sample or many samples, and look at how does the final train model change in response to that. So in all these cases, you can obtain generalization bounds. Now, unfortunately, both of these, these problems are not without their limitations. As we saw, the first approach suffers from, from the fact that it obtains vacuous bounds for sufficiently large model classes. The second approach suffers from the fact that you usually obtain, the, these measures are, are imperfect proxies for generalization. In particular, the, uh, the, the sharpness stuff, the minimum sharpness, doesn't have great empirical support for transformers and you know, the, the kinds of state-of-the-art language models that we're used to nowadays. Sometimes you find there's a, a negative correlation between minimum sharpness and out-of-distribution performance. So we need something else. And I propose, this is where the talk gets a little more persuasive and less pedagogical, that we need to, to walk the, the fine line between them. This intermediate regime where we're talking about model subclasses, where we're doing thermodynamics and statistical physics. In order to, to appreciate what this looks like, we have to take a step back, right? Because I lied to you. Really, there are two kinds of learning hidden in this equation. There's the first kind we saw, which is Bayesian inference, which is about finding the right weights. And then there's the second kind, which is model selection. It's about finding the right model class, the right architecture for the problem. This is a much harder problem, not least because this is not a continuous problem like the first one. You, you usually cannot continuously vary the, the model class. And second of all, the integrals involved in computing, you know, in, in evaluating model, model classes are difficult to impossible. So what do we do? Right. Despite these objections, I'm going to argue that this is actually a more sensible way to think about what, what learning is. So learning as model selection. I promise we're almost there with the definitions. Right. Learning is model selection requires reinterpreting these kinds of integ uh, integrals. So before, in the Bayesian context, we see this as an integral over uncert uncertainty, over your belief in some model class. Now, we need to reinterpret this as being an integral over an ensemble of learners, over a collection of learners. So why does it make sense to think about collections of learners? A few reasons. Well, first of all, there's usually, usually some initialization distribution. So if we want to come up with statements that are universal across the choice of initialization, we end up doing these kinds of integrals. We end up integrating over the possible starting weights. Second of all, there's also uncertainty in the, in the learning schedule, right? the particular order of batches and the, the gradient noise. So this also involves this kind of integral. 
at least in those moments when we want to make statements that, that apply to all learners, regardless of initializations, regardless of training schedule, we might want to study these integrals. Now, there are other reasons. Right? So you might be interested in evaluating your model over successive time steps and try to coarse grain and evaluate like, what is your model really doing over a, a much shorter time frame. And this involves performing an integral over successive time steps. And so again, you can evaluate these as some local collection of, of learners. And beyond this, there are maybe deeper reasons to think that studying ensembles is sensible. In physics, you have the idea of uh, mean field effects. But as you scale certain systems, make them larger and larger, the, the median ends up closer and closer to the mean. So the, you know, your average system is going to be very well described by the, by the actual averages of the quantities you're interested in. And then there's the fact that you know, usually there are a bunch of different models that are compatible with any, any amount of loss. So it's helpful to us to think of ourselves as being in the situation where we can't tell which of these models we're in, even though we have the exact weights. So this is compounded by the fact that if you have a singular model where the parameter function map is not one-to-one, -one, you have additional, additional uncertainty there. So this is why it makes sense, at least sometimes, to think about ensembles of learners. And now, in practice, when we're applying this, this kind of thinking to neural networks, it's going to be a little different than this integral. We'll be interested in evaluating expectation values of certain observables at some time. And you know, instead of a prior, this does have a laser pointer, doesn't it? Instead of a prior, we'll end up with some distribution over initializations. Instead of a likelihood, we'll end up with a distribution that depends on the optimizer and tells us what's the likelihood of ending up in this weight after this much time, depending on this particular training schedule, for example, and then evaluate expectation values of whatever observables we might be interested in. Right. Now, in order to evaluate these integrals, right, that's, that's the tricky part, this is where we go to singular learning theory, and why we need the insights from singular learning theory. So, you know, at first pass, it's just about this case where multiple weights implement the same function. But as we probe deeper, there's, there's a lot more to it. Right, we'll, we'll see the way in which we can interpret learning as a physical problem, a physical problem where the, the Hamiltonian, if you're familiar with the little physics, is actually given by the negative log likelihood. We'll see that the loss landscape, the, the shape of the loss landscape, plays an important role in, in learning dynamics and generalization performance. Now, we can actually talk about phase transitions during training using this language. We can formalize it and, and study this in more detail. And that will bring us to the, the final definition of learning for today. So let's start with the physics of risk. Seeing this as a physical problem is going to require changing how we write it down. I'm just going to choose a, little, uh, a new way of notating it. So what I've done here is I've just lifted up the likelihood into the exponent. So now it's the negative log likelihood. The same thing on the, on the right side. So I've lifted up the prior into this exponent. And on the denominator, I've just rewritten it, right? Uh, Bayesians prefer the, pr prefer the model evidence. Physicists prefer the partition function. Sorry, that's just the way physicists are, right? <laughs> if only everybody could agree on the same notation. And so this, this, this looks more like the Boltzmann distribution that we're familiar with in statistical physics. Where now the Hamiltonian is given by this, this exponent. The energy function for this physical system would be given by some combination of the negative log likelihood and the prior. In particular, we're going to be interested in the free energy, which is defined as the negative log of the partition function. This is the number of bits minus log of this probability distribution. And so we start to, to see all the, the various comparisons with physics fall into place. Instead of microstates, where in physics you're studying you know, the, the particular positions and velocities of particles in a gas, 
You're studying weights. What's the exact choice of weights you end up with? Instead of macro states determined by things like pressure, volume, temperature, you're looking at measurements like risk, you know, the, uh, the loss or the, the weight norm, maybe things like the margin, and maybe these other kinds of metrics we've, we've glanced, uh, quickly run over. And instead of the Boltzmann distribution, in this context, it's what's called the Gibbs measure. And so in physics, you assume that every microstate for a given macrostate is equally likely. Similarly, this is what you obtain if you assume that every choice of weights for a given amount of loss is equally likely. So in this, in this light, what Bayesian inference is, is it's the maximum entropy principle applied to the idea of learning. Now, for neural networks, it's going to be a little different because optimizers give us more complicated probability distributions than this. But still, it'll be something roughly similar. Right. So now we get to the, now we get to more pretty pictures. So you get to relax for a second. <laughs> right. What does the bottom of the loss landscape look like? You know, imagine it in, in the back of your mind. If you're imagining something like this, a basin, something that a physicist would call a harmonic oscillator, I'm sorry, you're wrong. In practice, you end up with valleys. There are usually directions at the bottom of the loss landscape along which you can walk that don't change the loss. And so these, these, these directions come from a bunch of places. So there are freedoms, gauge freedoms, in the language of physicists, that come from the choice of the architecture. So for example, if you have a ReLU, you can scale um, incoming weights by alpha, as long as you scale outgoing weights by one over alpha for any positive alpha. And you're going to get the same function computed at the end of the day. So this corresponds to some direction you can walk along that doesn't change the loss. Similarly for normalization layers. Right? It's just going to rescale it, so it's always the same scale output. And finally, you can you know, permute columns in one layer as long as you permute rows in the next. This is a discrete sy symmetry. So it's not going to be a continuous direction you can walk along, but still other, other choices of weights with the same values of the loss. Now, in addition to these symmetries that are, that are baked into the architecture, there are more interesting things going on. For example, oh, uh, this idea of degenerate nodes. If you have a zero somewhere in one of the layers, then you can move it around without necessarily needing to do a corresponding transformation in the next layer. So zeros are special. Now then, in addition, you know, what is a ReLU network doing? Really, it's doing piecewise linear approximation. And so each of these each of these regions has a normal vector associated to it. And, and there's a symmetry associated with flipping this normal, direct, uh, this normal vector, the discrete symmetry, which is only present locally. Now, in addition to these orientation reversals, there's a more interesting symmetry going on. And that's related to the fact that you can annihilate these decision boundaries. Right, so if I, if I move this up, if I bring these adjacent polytopes together, make them parallel to each other, then now there's a, there's a decision boundary here, but it's not doing anything meaningful. And I can slide this decision boundary left and right, at least within this regime, and it's, it's not going to change the overall function. This is a local way that I can change my model that doesn't change the loss. OK. But guess what? I lied to you. It's not just that the bottom of the lost landscape looks like, looks like a valley. It's that it typically looks like a, like a canyon structure. And so you have these points where the rivers at the bottoms of these canyons intersect each other. Now, if you look at this projected down, then these intersection points are non-differentiable, at least from the perspective of the set of the minimum, minimum loss points. So they're singularities. Singularities in the sense of um, a mathematical object missing some property, missing, missing some derivative. And it turns out that these points, these singularities, are, are, are 
the most important points in the loss landscape. They, did, they determine much of the model's learning behavior. So what does that look like? Well, they have two important properties, these points. First of all, you can think of them as generalizing. They're somehow simpler than other points, and thus generalize better. And the second thing is that singularities dominate. So long-term you know, training performance of these models is going to be dominated by these points. And to see the first point, note that if you're at the bottom of this point, then walking along this, this direction doesn't change the loss, and you can see your effective dimensionality as being lower. This isn't contributing to your expressivity. So your effective dimensionality is lower, and the actual function being implemented here is somehow simpler than you would guess from just looking at the parameter count outside. What you end up with is a statement that if you have a more complex sim singularity, you have fewer effective degrees of freedom, so you're simpler, and you end up generalizing better. And the second point is that if you're training on lots and lots of data, at least in this Bayesian context, you end up with, your, with the integrals you care about dominated by this point. So we saw this free energy, which is the, the minus log of this, this integral. And as we take the, the amount of data going to infinity, the number of samples going to infinity, the free energy gets this asympt asymptotic form. So there's some term here, which believe me, you can ignore. The important bit is right here. This lambda is a quantity associated to the singularity that measures how complex the singularity is. And so the larger this, this singularity, the more complex it is, the simpler or the smaller your free energy is going to be. And you end up with this weird statement where the local behavior here ends up determining the overall global expected behavior in this limit. And so together, these give us a sense of, of what singular learning theory is, is telling us, that you know, a few points in the loss landscape are way more important than, than other points. Now, in addition, what this lets us do is it lets us talk about phase transitions during training, moments during which the model goes through discrete sudden changes in, in capability. To see that, let's make a modification to this free energy. Right before we were performing an integral over this entire model class, now we're going to restrict our integral to just some subset of weights, some local subset of weights, w, big W. Now, if you do this, you apply the same analysis, you end up with the very same asymptotic form, where now the important singularity, the important quantity here, the RLCT, or real log canonical threshold, is given by the most important singularity, the largest singularity, within this region, instead of over the entire model class. So what can now happen is, I can smoothly vary this region. I can move W around and move it to some other place. And what you notice is, as I do this, at some point, this singularity leaves, leaves my view. And so that will lead to a, a discrete jump in the free energy which is exactly what we mean by a phase transition in physics, a first order phase transition. At some point, I move it some more, and a new singularity pops into view. And again, there will be a discrete change in the free energy and a sudden change in the model's performance. Because you know, the free energy can see a sudden, sudden change. And so what you end up with is a picture of during training, you are progressing from one neighborhood of a singularity to the next. Yes? So you're saying you're, getting, you're moving towards a singularity in the nearby. Uh, these singularities are to do with the properties of the lost landscape. Like it's underpined, certain things are underpined by location. Mm -hmm. What I'm struggling to see is, OK, so you're traveling through wave space, and you're just in your network doing things in whatever path you use that. Um, what actually changes in terms of, OK, I'm near a, a specific point in this landscape. Therefore, I'm implementing, like, concretely, a different function that is giving me different properties. I'm struggling to see how being close to this point, point rather than this point, like, you know, is, the, is the claim that this point here is somehow indicative of a set of functions in the nearby space. So, so let, let me see if I can reword your question. If, okay, 
so it's right. Um, you basically, what is the link between this and, and mechanistically what's going on inside of the function? Yeah. Um, so we can see this in a second. Um, I'll, yeah. Let me get back to this a little later. Okay. Um, there'll be some, some, a little more on this. Okay. If it's not enough, yeah, yell at me. <laughs> in any case, this is a very speculative image. It's like the most questionable image in, in the gray book, which sets out the, the basics of singular learning theory. But you might end up with an image of learning as consisting of a sequence of phase transitions, jumps between, between different singularities. You shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't focus too much on this particular picture, but something to, to influence your, your intuition. All right. So with this idea of restricted free energy, where we, we can move some local region around the, the, the loss landscape, that can go through discrete changes, we end up at our final definition of learning, which is learning as internal model selection. Right, you're, not change, you're not selecting between different model classes, but between different model subclasses, subclasses of the same overarching model class. OK. So here we're going to get into what could this actually mean? Right, and how could this maybe inform interpretability? Like what is the link between this and hopefully mechanism? What, what is actually going on inside of these functions. Well, I talked about three roles of theory. So let's take those one, one at a time. In terms of measuring devices, one idea you could try to build on is that of spectroscopes, or electron microscopes in physics. You can try to apply similar ideas to electron microscopes in, in the case of neural networks where you probe the, the loss landscape, you probe traces of singularities in the loss landscape in a way similar to how you probe for traces of singularities in the energy landscape. All right. In terms of experiments, what I have in mind is something like, like this. So you're running, uh, take a step back. All right, so as you're going through the training process, you are tracking performance on a bunch of different subtasks. So maybe one of those is you know, four-digit arithmetic. We know that large models often learn this quite suddenly within a specific band of training steps. So you can do this for hundreds or thousands of subtasks. Or maybe you can do something slightly different to this. In any case, at the same time that you're running these psychological probes, you're running structural probes. You're looking at structures in the in, in, in weights, in the loss landscape, informed by this theory, that go ding, 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 whenever your model's going through some sort of phase transition, whenever the, the local geometry of the loss landscape is tra changing dramatically. You can try to, to link these to each other. So if the model's gone through a large structural change, you go, okay, let's pause the training process. Let's run a whole another panel of evals. Let's run my mechanistic interpretability tools. Let's try anomaly detection. Let's do adversarial training and try to find out what the structural change actually corresponds to. And in the reverse direction, if you notice that the model has suddenly acquired a, a new ability, you can look at the, the structures and try to understand, based off of these kinds of observables, what has actually gone on. And so you know, in, the, in the room where they're training GPT-5, somebody's looking at the, the weights scrolling through past them in, in green matrix letters. And every so often they hear a ding. Your model has learned some new ability. So hit pause if that ability is safe and <laughs> continue otherwise. Who knows? <laughs> now, there is more to this. And so if we're looking at, again, level sets of the loss, so the, the sets of minimum loss points, they seem to have, um, these singularities seem to have a kind of substructure. So for the algebraic geometers among you, <laughs> now, when you're studying these kinds of systems in algebraic geometry, what you do is this procedure called resolution of singularities. You try to pull it apart. You pull it apart because now calculating the quantities associated to the singularity, like the RLCT, is easier in this blow-up space. 
sometimes this procedure introduces new components. Um, and, and those components are a kind of substructure of these singularities. And there are other ways to go about showing this, other ways to talk about substructure of singularities. But in any case, you, know, you can try to do some sort of subatomic physics and try to correlate this structure, the internal structure in the models. So that's something to get into in the Q&A maybe because it, it gets wild. <laughs> but in any case, um, you can try to do more than just detect phases. You can try to actually link the local structure of the lost landscape with the capabilities of the model. And finally, in terms of a common language, there is some speculation that you might be able to, at the very end of all of this, be able to talk about your model the final model you end up with, the final weights you end up with, as constructed out of the phases encountered during training, as composed out of these phases. And that seems to me like it could be a much easier way to go about interpretability. Right now, if you're looking for circuits inside of a 100 billion dimensional model, I mean, good luck. But if it turns out that we can decompose this into only a few thousand phase transitions, I think our odds are much better. So. Let's take a step back. There was a lot of content here. <laughs> right, we started with learning theory. What it is, the questions in one second. So why theory? Why not the potential risks? We talked about learning, these five different definitions of learning. We ended up talking about learning as internal model selection. We talked about learning theory, a classical learning theory, which is about bounding the risk. And singular learning theory, which is about, is, is about finding expectation values for subclasses, model subclasses, which is about studying these more interesting models that have this parameter to function map that's not one-to-one. -one. And we talked about potential applications to interpretability, to safety, to detect detecting sudden capability jumps. Do you want to learn more? I've written a few kind of blog post style introductions, and I am, you know, I'm working on this Somewhat, next to all the other things that I'm up to. And if you're really interested in this, well, next month, kind of short notice for you guys, there's a workshop that I'm organizing with Alexander over in the back. Hey, Alexander. <laughs> uh, in Berkeley, where we're bringing together people from the singular learning theory world with people studying AI safety and seeing what we can do together. So with that, thank you. Let's get to questions. So, thanks. Uh, it's, I think it makes total sense and it's uh, great that you have done all this work. And so, one thing I would like to question, if I may, yeah. is now you talked about phase transitions. And I agree that there are certain singular points in the lost landscape and through the learning you transition from one one to the other. Now, and the singularities are certain inherent properties of the lost landscape to that time. But as you have shown and said, I guess, it's not only those points, but it's rather how you make the phase transitions. That matters, right? So how you go from, or, or from which singular point you, you kind of, so that, let's say this algorithmic trajectory that yeah. you take an indicator mm -hmm. of the capabilities you are going to be endowed with. Mm -hmm. here. Now, um, as such, it's not so, and, and that trajectory is rather, well, it's a function of the lost landscape, but at the same time, it's a function of the data set and the optimizer you choose. So, it's, if you are taking thinking of the collection of phase transitions, um, then the lost landscape, it's not all in the lost landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that statement would be a little misleading. Mm -hmm. It would be in the, op in the optimizer, for instance. Right? And it's, it's trivial to think that uh, certain optimizers will not work. Mm -hmm. You are choose a bad learning rate, and good luck with finding some new mm -hmm. So how do you put this in context? Do you think about these uh, trajectories and that, that, that made the face and, 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 and 
the way that those phase transitions occur? Or are you looking only in the final region? Because mm -hmm. then it's a little lucky. Yeah. So let, let's see Just if I can get it. Yes, I'm going, to try, I'm going to try my best to summarize the question. So, so uh, it sure seems like it's not just the, the it's, just not, it's not just the fact that there are singularities in the loss landscape. It's a particular order you succeed through these singularities. There seems to be a path dependence during training, where you know we, we observe this regularly, where models that are fine tuned with different seeds end up generalizing in different ways, and so. Something pretty fundamental seems to be happening with the order in which you're navigating the loss landscape, which singularity you see at a given point in time. So how, how does that square with this, this picture? How, how do you incorporate that in this theory? Um, I, think, I think that follows under this, falls under this, this last point. You're trying to build an understanding of the final ways as, as constructed out of this succession of phase transitions. But I would, I would say it's an open question. I, I don't know if we. For example, yeah. there are results um, that, if, as you think about this entire trajectory, mm -hmm. it's like it, it's producing one neural network at a time, and gather all of this into a very large point cloud. Um, so, sorry, could, sorry, could you speak on? I can give you a microphone. Yeah, um, I can speak on. We can try this. So. Audience is also he here, like online. Okay, well, yeah. So I was just thinking, if if you are thinking of the of a of of optimization as basically generating one neural network at a given time step, composed of a large dimensional uh, you know weight space, um, then this trajectory that you are taking, let's say during like the singularities you visit during learning would correspond to how this multidimensional object is shaped. And so the geometry and topology of that object is, could also be an indicator of, um, mm -hmm. of how learning has, has been. And I fully agree, spotting that singularities is actually kind of like um, simplifying that object mm -hmm. from you know, of millions of points to certain points in that high dimension space that you would like to um, analyze. Mm -hmm. And I think that could be a good link. I think also if we go back to maybe this image. Or right, like I talked about 